Okay, let's talk about vestigial, homologous, and analogous structures. So I want you to write these four questions. We'll leave a little bit of room on your packet. So number one, what is a vestigial structure? Number two, give one example of vestigial structure in humans and one in animals. Three, what do the similar limbs, either arm or leg, of the animals suggest? And four, why are bird, bat, and butterfly wings considered to be analogous? Pause the video right here and copy down those four questions. Okay, let's talk about human vestigial structures. A vestigial structure is something that no longer does what it was originally evolved for. On humans, we have a couple examples. First off, ear muscles. Some of us, myself included, can wiggle our ears, you know, just kind of move them up and down there. The question is why? It doesn't really serve much of an advantage. Well, a vestigial structure like this is something that doesn't do what it was originally evolved for. We had those ear muscles evolved so we could just know we weren't cats, but you see the general idea here. Those ear muscles are there to move it around. We don't need to move around our ears because we have much more mobile necks compared to animals that do that. So, those ear muscles don't do what they originally evolved for. Why are, we, why are they even there? Our ancestors needed them. How about wisdom teeth? A lot of you, myself included as well, have had your wisdom teeth removed. That's because over time, our jaws have shrunk as we've essentially learned to cook. Now, when you cook, you don't need to chew as much. However, when your jaws shrink, if the number of teeth remain the same, you run into problems there. In wisdom teeth, it's an extra tooth that no wonder does what it was evolved for. Grinding plants, we don't need it. An appendix. Some of you, myself included as well, have also had your appendix removed. Well, the appendix is something that no longer does what it was originally evolved for. In this case, it serves as an extra little area at the end of your large intestine for fermenting things and breaking down plants. We don't have as much of a plant diet as we used to, but we still have the appendix, and occasionally it kills you. But it doesn't do what it was originally evolved for. And some of you, not myself this time, have a uh, broken a tailbone or heard of someone who's broken their tailbone. Well, the tailbone serves as an attachment site for some muscles, but for the most part, it doesn't do what it was originally evolved for, namely, have a tail. Animals that have tails actually have more stuff extending from them. We don't, it, but we still have the tailbone. doesn't do what it was evolved for. Or goosebumps. Now, you get goosebumps for one of two possible reasons. You're scared or you're cold. And the idea is when you're scared, it puffs up and makes you appear larger. You'll sometimes see that in animals, like chimpanzees or cats are a much more obvious example. It makes them appear larger. So they do that when they're scared. We still get that, even though obviously when our hair stands on its end, it doesn't make us appear that much larger. And also you'll get it when you're cold. You get your hair standing up like that. That's to help trap another layer of air near your skin, and the hair traps that. However, we don't have enough hair there to actually make a difference, but we still have that reflex there that makes our hair actually stand up to make us appear larger. Why? We originally came from organisms that had more hair. These, this reaction no wonder does what it was originally evolved for. Okay, so let's look at some vestigial structures on animals. Whales and snakes have leg bones. In case you haven't noticed, whales and snakes don't have legs. Why on earth do they still have these bones? Well, they're descended from creatures that did have legs. They no want, they still have the bones, but they no longer do what they were originally evolved to do. Flightless birds still have wings. This is called the flightless cormorant. Really cool video right here if you want to check that out about the flightless cormorant. They still have wings, but if you'll notice how ratty those things are, they can't fly with them. And they still even flap them like they're trying to fly. They do fantastic swimmers. They're some of the best swimmers around, but they still have wings only because their ancestors did. They don't do what they were originally evolved to a type of bird, not the fruit, that's something different. But they still have wings. Why? Their ancestors had them. Ostriches, same idea. Their wings now do something new. It's not that ostrich wings are useless, it uses them sometimes for like protecting the young or making itself appear larger or sometimes like cooling off or mating displays, but it doesn't do what it originally evolved for, namely flight. Animals with non-functional eyes. It seems kind of weird, but this is called uh, Mexican, or sorry, this is called the blind Mexican cavefish, and here is its closest living relative. You'll notice right there, it still has an eyeball. Why? Well, it's descended from creatures that used to have eyes. It only still has them because it doesn't do it originally evolved for. It's vestigial. Here you can see the difference between the one that lives where there is light and the one that lives where it's not. This one has an advantage. It doesn't waste energy making pigment. That eye is not vulnerable to, you know, essentially diseases uh, making their way in through there. 
it has an advantage in the darkness. Why does it even have the eye? If ancestors needed them. This is the blind salamander. These are animals that grow essentially where there is no light. The only reason they still have eyes is because their ancestors needed them. If you looked at a mole, if you actually were to dissect a mole, they have eyes, but they're covered by skin and covered by fur. Neither one of those helps it see. Why do they have them? Their ancestors did. Underground, though, eyes are a liability, so they essentially lose more and more of them, but the only reason they have them is because their ancestors did. This is the uh, model of a blue whale. Blue whales are freaking huge, if you've never seen a skeleton of them, but if you look closely, they have leg bones. You'll notice they're not attached. They had to essentially put a metal frame there. They're not attached to the other bones. The only reason they have them is because their ancestors did. They have to suspend them here to show they still have the bones, but they don't need them anymore. If you were to look at uh, an embryo, this is a dolphin embryo. Those are hind leg, hind limb buds. Why? Dolphins don't have hind legs. Well, their ancestors did. And occasionally you'll see one born with what's called an atavistic trait. Namely, it's got legs. Why? Well, their ancestors had them, and occasionally a mutation brings them to the surface like this. This is a manatee skeleton. Manatees are also called the sea cows there. They have leg bones. Why? They don't have legs. Their ancestors did. Why have them there in the first place? It makes no sense if you were to think about like creating a manatee and putting it there. The only thing that really makes sense is that essentially they're descended from creatures that did have legs. This is a horse leg, but you'll notice it's got something extra there. This is called a polydactyl horse. Occasionally, a horse is born with this, essentially an extra toe. The only reason they have that is because they're descended from creatures that had more toes, and over time they've lost them. But occasionally, a mutation will bring one back to the surface. This creature here is called the Basilosaurus. Basilosaurus is extinct. All that we have left now is fossils. But as you can see, they were huge. This is the Basilosaurus uh, skeleton right there. These are pictures I took when I was actually at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. You'll see, this is a really, really, really large animal. But look closely there. Those are leg bones. These legs are maybe a six inches to a foot long. Why would a 60 foot long creature need legs that were essentially six inches long? Well, they don't. The only reason they have them is because their ancestors did. Here you can see other uh, skeletons very similar to it, and you'll notice They've got those tiny, tiny, tiny little useless legs. The only reason they had them is because their ancestors did. It's vestigial. It doesn't do what it was originally evolved for. And you can see here, here if we looked at the evolution of whales, here we go from the past to the present, uh, you can see what the whales are now is probably descended from creatures that looked something like an ancient wolf that over time spent more and more time in the water and creatures that were better adapted to the water had an advantage, more likely to survive and reproduce. Over time those legs shrunk because those legs weren't helpful. The only reason they even have them is because their ancestors did. Here's the evolution of the horse. Here's the modern day horse. The further you go back in time though you'll notice extra toes or fingers if you will. That's because horses were descended from creatures with more toes and occasionally you see one come out with the extra toe. The only reason they have them is because their ancestors did. More cool stuff on the evolution of horses. Now let's get into something else called the homologous structure. Homo meaning the same. Look at the crocodile limb and the mouse limb. They are even though they're very, very, very different animals, they have the same plan. One bone, the humerus, two bones, the radius and the ulna, then you've got the carpals and the metacarpals. One, two, bunch of blobs, and then five digits. This is called a homologous structure. Here we have a human, a whale, a bird, and a crocodile. And they all have the exact same plan, the exact same setup. One bone, two bones, bunch of blobs, and then five digits, including a thumb. The manatee, the mole, and the bat. Very, very, very different animals. One swims, one digs, one flies. But they have, across these very, very different animals, very, very, very similar structures. At least the layout is about the same. Here you can see the humerus, radius, all in the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. What is that? Even whales have thumbs. A dolphin has thumb. Why? Well, that implies that they all share a common ancestor who had that plan. One bone, humerus, two bones, radius and all that, bunch of blobs, your carpals, and then your metacarpals and your phalanges. And you'll notice all of them even have a thumb, something that only has three bones as opposed to four. In bats, they adapted that for flying. Dolphins adapted that for swimming. An anteater adapted that for tearing. A mole adapted this plan for digging. A horse adapted it for running, and they lost some of those fingers. A pig adapted it for walking, and a monkey uh, adapted it for grasping. The same plan. One, two, blobs, five you see across all of these different animals. Well, this implies 
that they share a common ancestor who had that plant. And you look back in the fossil record, you even see this. Fossil amphibians still have one, two blobs and five digits. So that is a homologous structure. We have the same plan in different organisms, which implies a common ancestor. Now compare that to something called an analogous structure. This is a pterodont or pterodactyl. This is a bat and this is a bird. They all have the same structure. They have a wing, but they've gotten to it in radically different ways. Uh, here we have a butterfly and a pterodon and a uh, bird and then a bat. So these are called analogous structures. They have the same function, but they got to it with very, very, very different setups. Homologous is where you have the same plant and it does different things. Here I have the same general idea, a wing. But this one here is an elongated single finger. Uh, this one in a bat is an elongated hand with very long fingers. And then a bird, essentially the whole arm has been short, uh, the whole arm has been lengthened, and you can see it's kind of just a single finger down there, and they have feathers for the flight surface. Very, very, very different ways of getting to a very, very, very similar idea. This is called convergent evolution, where the same environment produces similar adaptations, it's called analogous structures, in different organisms. Here I have a shark, I have a dolphin, and I have a penguin. And they all have the same general structure. They're pointy, and they have some method of propulsion at one end, even though one's a fish, one's a mammal, and one's a bird. They've gotten to the same idea, streamlined, propulsion at one end, through very, very, very different ways.